If you have anything in your life that is working against you, listen up. Today, you are going to learn to identify the toxins in your life. From the people in your life, to the relationships, to your work environment, any or all of them can be toxic. They can prevent you from reaching your full potential. In studio today, I have none other than a detox strategist, Ms. Nicole L. Turner. Nicole helps others identify their toxins and develop the strategy they need to reach their goals. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Now, detoxing to me is something new. At first, I thought, this a fad or a trend, it'll pass. <laughs> 10, 15 years later, we still talk about detoxing. Okay, first, how did you get involved in detoxing? So what I found was that patterns were repeating themselves in my life. Okay. Like no matter what job I had, no matter what I was doing with my friends and family, people were always coming to me and I started to see certain themes across the board. A lot of people were struggling with moving forward in their finances, their personal relationships, their romantic relationships, their relationships with themselves and their careers and their health because they had not dealt with those mental and emotional toxins that had manifested themselves in their lives for so long. So I was like, you know what, there's a need for this. And so it just actually, it just kind of found me just by happenstance. And um, more people need to pay attention to that. Like so many times we go through life and we don't recognize that there's some things we need to address. Mm -hmm, we mm -hmm, just kind of mm -hmm. put it on the back burner because it's always been there. Mm -hmm. But then we wonder why we see the same cycles happening because we haven't dealt with those things. So I want to help people deal with those things and help organizations deal with those things. Okay, when you say detox, define detoxing for me. So when I say detox, oftentimes people hear physical detox, like, oh, I need to cleanse so I can lose weight. Mm -hmm. But this detox is a purge. First, it's a recognizing your issues what, where they stem from, what are the causes, how they're impacting your life, and then finding ways to purge, to deal with them and to get rid of them so you can move forward. So when I say detox, it's kind of like a cleansing and mm -hmm. a mental and emotional and sometimes spiritual cleansing, purging, and then developing a strategy to move forward. How can detoxing help us emotionally? So detoxing, first of all, becoming aware of those issues like we all have all of us have those emotional moments that may have stemmed from our childhood that may have been something you know there may have been family members who were like oh you're the fat kid or or you're never going to be anything that impacted us emotionally and we carry that throughout our lives like we had these self-esteem issues we always saw ourselves as less than and because of that it had an impact on the things that the choices we made, the um, way we pushed ourselves, the things we would go for, because we were like, oh, I'm, not, I'm never gonna measure up, because I have this person in my ear from when I was a kid that was impacting my ability to see me for who I am. And because you never dealt with that, and never set, in some instances, you have to go back to the people. Because oftentimes I say to people, everyone's fighting a battle that we know nothing about. True. And mm -hmm. sometimes in our childhood, because a lot of people, a lot of things started there. You know, the people who are saying the offensive things to us and who are hurting us, they're going through their own battles. They're going through their own issues and it's manifesting itself in how they interact with us. Like, let's say for example, you know, I'm a dark complexion girl. I never had this issue, but I've heard other young ladies say, you know, my aunt didn't like me because I was the darkest one in the family. Maybe the aunt was probably the same complexion, but she had her own issues and she projected that onto you. And those are emotional things that carry you throughout your life. That unless you get to a place where you feel comfortable acknowledging that I have some things that I need to deal with, which is a big step. A lot of us don't wanna go inward and hold ourselves accountable for the things that are impacting us and then confronting those yeah, things. We just are, wanna keep moving with we life. We wanna keep moving, mm -hmm. you know, because it's hard. Confrontation is hard. By confrontation, I mean confronting the things that are bothering us, the things that have negatively impact us. So a lot of people struggle with that. Being honest with the person in the mirror. Yes, and that's hard. Now, how can your relationships 
be toxic, but not abusive? Oh, easily. We, mm -hmm. Let's say, for example, you have a girlfriend who's a really, well, you would like to think she's a good friend, <laughs> but re reality is she wants your life. She's, if you're dating somebody and she's not dating somebody, she's always like trying to highlight things that are wrong, right? If- Ooh, you, girl, he late. I wouldn't <laughs> let him be late on me. He always right. late picking you up. Yeah. Those okay. type of things. Okay. Or if you have romantic relationships where the person is not mentally, emotionally, or verbally abusing mm -hmm. you, but they're just not giving you what you need in that relationship. Like you may tell them, I need for you to be more attentive or I, I need for you to pay attention when I'm talking to you. And sometimes, you know, they may be distracted doing other things. And the more they make you feel emotionally abandoned and disregarded, it's not a form of abuse per se, but it is toxic. And if you're in relationships, like some people are in romantic relationships where it's always a competition. The small things yes. that hook onto your emotions mm -hmm. and stay there, resonate day after day after, even if they don't resonate within you, that same so-called friend is there mm -hmm. and they're saying those things to you over and over and over. Mm -hmm. So it's not abusive as in a direct insult or a hit, it's a hit on your emotions. Yes. Mm -hmm. What happens when it's family? Oh my gosh. It's even harder when it's family. And some people, especially if it's a parent or a sibling, it's, it's harder to address because you're like, you are my, my family. You're like the closest people to me. But sometimes they're worse for you than, than strangers are because they feel like because I am family, I can treat you this way. And they can be very, very toxic. And then there's a code within family that you're just supposed to deal with it because family doesn't turn on each other or mm -hmm. tell on each other. Mm -hmm. So if someone was to say, the person that is most toxic to me is a sibling, can I cut that sibling off? Well, you can put some distance between you and that. You can, you can set boundaries. Just because they're your sibling doesn't mean you have to be accepting of the behavior. You can first speak to the person and make him or her aware of how they're making you feel. And if they don't do anything to make changes, mm -hmm. then you have to set the boundaries. You have to say, I'm not going to accept this. I'm not gonna spend as much time with them. If I'm talking to them and I feel the conversation is going a certain way, I'm gonna cut the conversation off. So it's on you. If they're not gonna change, you have to be the one to change. Take the accountability mm -hmm. for yourself. Yep. And create that safe space. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about the toxic work environment. <laughs> <laughs> because we are connected to our work environments because yes. it provides, you know, the, it's the source for our food, clothing, and shelter. Yes. Nobody wants to be without food, clothing, and shelter. No. But let's so be, let's... tell me first, let's do first. What are some of the things that would make an environment toxic? So let's say, for example, you have a coworker. Mm -hmm. The time you walk in the door, that person's always complaining or gossiping about what other coworkers are doing or complaining about the boss, complaining about the work that's draining and it's very toxic. Or it could be a situation where you have people, you're doing all the work and other people are getting all the accolades and getting all the promotions and your boss only finds things that are wrong with your work and not other people's work. Mm -hmm. Or if you have a boss who's micromanaging or someone who's very condescending, uh, those are examples of toxic work environments. And we all have experienced them <laughs> at some point in time. <laughs> How would you tell a person to handle a toxic work? That's the work environment first. So if it's a toxic coworker, you know, I tell people the good thing to do is if you know somebody that's their behavior to always be um, creating an environment that makes you feel very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. limit that time with that coworker, try to shift the conversation to something more positive if they're always complaining. Okay. If it's your supervisor, go to him or her and have a conversation because sometimes people aren't even aware of their behavior. And then if it doesn't change and it's really having a negative impact on you, go to the, you know, your supervisor's supervisor. But sometimes you have to like step away. Like I tell people, we all get breaks on work, on our jobs. And if you have to go for a 10 minute walk and we all have our phones and our headsets and mm -hmm. listen to, a TED talk or listening to raindrops, music or something to relax you. And a lot of work environments now, they have gyms on site. If you go to a yoga class or go, you know, work out at lunchtime or something to kind of ease your, your tension and your okay. stress. But the more you engage in those type of environments, the more it's going to impact you because you can't pull off the layers and leave yourself at work when you 
leave work. So you take some of that home and it impacts your personal life, it impacts your relationship with your kids if you have kids, your spouse, mm -hmm. and your ability to, to just rest. And that becomes stressful. And we all know stress plays a big role in our health. So you have to find a way to have your releasing moments. And I often tell people how you start your day has a big impact on how your day is going. So if you're like me, snooze is my, my best friend. <laughs> so if you're rushing in the mornings, okay. you already started your day in the wrong way because everything's going to be off because you were very hurt, hurtedly. You were like, oh, I don't have time to get my coffee. I don't have time to get my bagels. I'm rushing. And then you come into work and somebody's talking to you and you're already like, oh, and traffic was backed up. Mm -hmm. And so that has a tremendous impact on how your day is going, even before the toxic coworker or toxic boss has had an opportunity to talk to you. Okay, so those are the environments. You can have toxic friends, we have toxic mm -hmm. relationships, we can, talk, to we can have toxic work environments. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we, because a lot of the times when you're, when you're the person that's inside the tornado, mm -hmm. you can't see all of the different things that are rolling around or flying around above your head. Mm -hmm. How can we, say, identify that something, one of those entities in our life is toxic to even know that we need to get to a strategist to help us come up with a strategy to work through it. Well, it should feel, it's a feeling for you. And I think all of us, whether it's work environment or relationships, something just doesn't feel right. It stresses okay. you. Okay. Um, it impacts how you sleep, it impacts your ability to think clearly. There are always signs of toxicity. It's not like you're just going through life and everything is perfect. And so you don't have a, you don't know. But if you're miserable, and especially in your personal relationships, if all you're doing is feeling unhappy and feeling miserable, that's a sign that something's off there. In your work environment, if you're always like, oh, I got to get out of this job and I really hate this job. But for some people, they like the work. It's not the work that's driving them crazy. It's the environment of the boss. And so if you feel like I can't do this, I'm never going to get forward in my job, that's a sign that something's off. So you, even if the tornado is going on, you feel that. What if I told you that you could stop the negative tape from playing inside your head? What if with seven simple steps, you could leave the pain of the past behind and live every day as your true authentic self? It is possible and you can do it. The ebook, Seven Simple Steps to Beat Emotional Baggage, how to become whole, healed, healthy, and happy, shares how to resolve emotional baggage. And feel free to live true to your own personality, spirit, and character. Transform negative thinking into positive thinking and become equipped to boldly face your past and resolve emotional pain. Get your free copy at thatanitalive.com slash ebook. And we're back talking with Nicole Turner, the detox strategist. Nicole, what are some of the ways that organizations properly detox? Well, one of the ways is first doing like an organizational climate survey or an assessment. Okay. Get feeding, getting feedback from your employees, assessing what they think are the issues and the organization and also like an appreciative inquiry model. I really like it because instead of employees just saying, oh, morale is bad. No, my boss doesn't communicate with me. They are actually given suggestions on how that boss or how the organization can shift, uh, improve the morale, improve communication, improve whatever the issues, huh? the issues are. And taking that data and identifying certain themes that they see throughout the board within the organization or a particular directorate or division or mm -hmm, mm -hmm. unit, and then developing a strategy to address, like a lot of times developing an employee engagement strategy or changing your strategic plan or your change management strategy helps um, come up with ideas and a roadmap to change the culture of the organization and then implementing that. And of course we know that funding is a big issue for some people and resources are a big issue. So tackling what are the, the big ticket items that you can address that have the greatest impact on the organization and shifting that culture. Shifting the culture seems very difficult. It is very difficult. Because we've seen a lot of engagement strategies, but they still seem to be on a very high level mm -hmm. and the day-to-day -day people are not impacted. 
So I often recommend to organizations is that the people who are actually doing the work, they need to have a seat at the table. They need to be a part of the decision-making process because a lot of times it's top down when in some instances it should be bottom up because people managers are really good at managing up to their bosses. So a lot of times that boss who sits here has no idea what's going on here because that middle person <laughs> has <whatsoever>. filtered <laughs> what's really going on. Mm -hmm. So the best way to do it is at least have some employees, employees at all levels, junior, journeyman, mid-level employees, also a part of the decision-making, the strategy development process because they can better tell you whether or not something is gonna work because they are the ones doing the work. Okay, so we've gone up the ladder from the individual mm -hmm. into the work environment, organization, back down. Mm -hmm. Let's go back down into the individual and relationships mm -hmm. because you've written a number of books, mm -hmm. two of which <laughs> I have here, <laughs> and one title is Live Now, Die Later. Yes, so Live Now, Die Later is really about some people who have just made the decision to live by default and not by design. That one doesn't specifically deal with your relationships with other people. It's mm -hmm. really about taking ownership and taking control of your own life. Don't just let life happen to you. You take control of what comes in. You take control of where you go and not just let other people or just the, the Congress or the president or mm -hmm your family members or your spouse or whomever control your destiny. So in that book, I'm really giving people, and all my books are conversational. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have a table of contents because I want people to be able to open it anywhere and take a nugget from it. So in that book, at the very end, I have a 21 day assignment because- Assignment? An assignment, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just read and not start, you know, I tell people baby steps is forward motion. So as long as you're moving forward, trying to make change and progress happen in mm -hmm. your life, you're gonna get there. And don't expect it to happen overnight because we didn't get into certain situations overnight, whether it's a financial situation. Mm -hmm. People, you didn't get into debt overnight. All right. And people really underestimate the impact that mental and emotional toxins have on our financial well-being. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're depressed, your remedy may be to go out and buy things. Or if you are in a situation where, you know, I have all this debt and that's affecting me mentally and emotionally. So there is an overlay between the finances and your, your mental and emotional health. And so when I'm talking about live now and die later, I'm really telling people to wake up every day in a state of gratitude. And all of my books, I emphasize somewhere in the book, the importance of being grateful because they say we have what, 60,000 thoughts a day and 80% of those are negative. negative. Mm -hmm. So if you find a way to shift your mindset, the more you expect greatness and goodness to come into your life, mm -hmm. the more it will come. What if I told you that you could stop the negative tape from playing inside your head? What if with seven simple steps, you could leave the pain of the past behind? and live every day as your true, authentic self. It is possible, and you can do it. The ebook, Seven Simple Steps to Beat Emotional Baggage, How to Become Whole, Healed, Healthy, and Happy, shares how to resolve emotional baggage. And feel free to live true to your own personality, spirit, and character. Transform negative thinking into positive thinking and become equipped to boldly face your past and resolve emotional pain. Get your free copy at thatanitalive.com slash ebook. You tell people a lot of times, stop feeding your history. Yes. <laughs> what does that mean? Because you're, you're giving so much fuel to what happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It's preventing you from moving forward. Oh, well, you know, I dated this guy and he, he just treated me this kind of way. Okay, well, that was 10 guys ago. <laughs> and you're still holding on to, to what Tommy did to you, mm -hmm. where you've allowed what Tommy did to you to totally destroy the wonderfulness that you have in Michael who's right in front of you because you're making somebody else pay for what the other person did. You know, I remember I was telling this guy, there's no room on this plane for my luggage because of all of your baggage. Woo! 
you <laughs> you have to let that go. If you had a job where your boss was absolutely horrible, so you go into this new job expecting your boss to be absolutely horrible because you're feeding your history. You're not giving yourself the opportunity to experience something new because you're so focused on the past. And That's behind you. And then you become toxic to yourself. Yes, which is why my very first book was <laughs> Detox Your Life, Building a Healthy Relationship with Yourself and Others. Yeah. Because all of your relationships, the success of all your relationships start with your ability to have a healthy relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's what you feed, the poison you feed to yourself that can be more toxic than what anybody else can give you. Woo! <laughs> Stop feeding your history. Make yes. yourself important. Yes. Now, in this book, the previous one was Live Now, mm -hmm. Live Now, Die Later. Yes. And this one, as you said, is Detox Your Relationship. Know when to stay and when to let go. And specifically, you're talking about love relationships. I am. Romantic relationships, yes. And we are going into the Valentine's love month. <laughs> and everybody, <laughs> it is said, everybody either wants to be in a relationship. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know when it became popular, but it was called cuffing season. Because mm -hmm, it's cold outside. I don't remember. Yeah. I mean, I remember people saying that relationships increase in the winter, mm -hmm. but I think the whole cuffing word is new. Yeah, I think cuffing probably became popular a few, three, maybe three or four years ago. Yeah, because you want to cuddle up and cuff with somebody because it's cold outside. I don't know who started it. Why? But you know, with social media, once mm. people start using it, it becomes popular. So. Right. Well, <laughs> why does everybody want to be in a relationship? Well, a lot of people want to be in a relationship because they just don't want to be by themselves. They don't, they don't want to be alone. And some people feel like, I need that person to complete me, when no, you should go into the relationship already complete, already whole. And a lot of people are like, I'm looking for my other half. Well, if you're a half and they're a half, you're going to have some serious problems because you're not a whole and she's not a whole or he's not a whole. So, yeah. And the reason why this subtitle is know when to stay and when to let go mm -hmm. is that some people stay when they really should walk away. And so I give real examples and I'm very transparent. I share a lot of my, you know, unfortunately, guys who date me, they're like, oh, my gosh, am I going to end up in a book? But I never <laughs> tell the names. So, <laughs> but you know, before Oprah ever told us during the, the award show, tell, speak your truth, mm -hmm. your, I was doing mm -hmm. that all alone. So in the book, it's important to tell people, you know, sometimes you want to throw a relationship away just because of, of one idiosyncrasy or one, you know, uh, issue that the person had, but they're really good for you. They have a good heart. They're your, your biggest champion, but because they don't come packaged maybe the way you want, you walk away. And so I, I try to give real life examples of when is it best to try to work it out? And when is the cue to say, bye bye, this is not working. Now, is your book only for certain ages? Nope. Because their relationships for people now are getting younger and younger. So I try to write in a way where if you're in high school, you can pick it up okay. and, and take from it. And if you are a 70 year old dating, you can. Which is a shock and a surprise to well, me. Hey, that, Big that, mama has swag, That honey. happens, that happens a lot. <sighs> it does. Whoa. You mentioned in your book, we mistakenly assume that if our partners love us, they will react and behave in certain ways. Mm -hmm. The ways we react and behave when we love someone. Mm -hmm. So we all have our own love language. And our love, the way we show love is based mm -hmm. on our own personal experiences, maybe based on what we saw in our household or what other relationships taught us. So we assume that if you love me, you're gonna love me the way that I need you to love me. But some people are loving you the way that they know how to love you, which may be totally different from what you need, but it doesn't mean that they don't love you. They're just loving you at the level that they know how to love you. So that's why I say in everything, communications is, ve is very important. You need to speak to your mate. And it's, you know, it's not how you say it, it's not what you say, but how you say it. Mm -hmm. So especially when it comes to you know, men, if you're always like beating them up and, and making them feel like nothing you do is, is good, they're not gonna wanna listen to you when you're talking about, I really need you to do this for me. Mm -hmm. This is how I need you to show me that you love me because you've already shut them down. So you can only love at the capacity that you know how to love, how to receive and how to give. Okay, this is great. One, one more, <laughs> <laughs> hold on. Don't let those WYD texts fool you. 
there's a man out there willing to put in time and effort to court you. Is there yeah. a difference in courting and dating? There is. So, you know, those what you doing, that's what WID, text messages. We, we know what that means. And sometimes they'll send them on some random day. You haven't heard from them in a couple of months. What you doing? Oh, you bored? Oh, the person you were supposed to hang out with, they, they weren't available. So, you know, when somebody is courting you, they're, they're very gentlemanlike. They're very, they're very polite. They are very attentive. You know, they're not trying to rush you to the bedroom. You know, they're really trying to get to know you. They're really trying to show you how important you are to them. You know, they're trying to build that friendship with you. And I tell people, like is far more important than love. Because if you can love the person you're with, but if you don't like them, that's going to be a very unhappy relationship. relationship yeah. And the like piece is the friendship. And so many people are in relationships with people that they're not friends with. And then they wonder why everything fell apart. I can't talk to you like I can talk to my best girlfriend or my best guy friend because we were never friends. We hooked up because, oh, you were fine and I was fine. Or, mm. you know, we were both drinking in the club or whatever. You right, know, there's right, some commonality right. that brought you together and then you just kind of stayed, you know, and maybe the physical was really good. And then you wake up one day and you're like, I don't really like this person mm. at all. And then those are the people who are sending you to what you do in text messages in the middle of the night. <laughs> and those are the type of people you need to detox. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Being healthy emotionally and mentally involves every aspect of your life. Your physical health affects your emotional health. Your emotional health affects your mental health. Practice self-help and make the commitment to take time out to care for your needs. Reach out to Nicole Turner. Visit her website at detoxstrategist.com. I'm Anita, your host. Be sure to check out that'sanitalive.com for where and when to see our next episode.